All right, all right, all right. Good evening, folks. Uh, this is Michael Tekin Strode of the Colonet Collaborative, uh, uh, coordinator and uh, um, founding coordinator, rather, of the Colonet Collaborative, uh, Chicago's very own um, time and service uh, skills exchange, or, you know, time based service and skills exchange. Um, I always get a bit tongue tied there. Um, thank you for joining this broadcast this evening. Um, we, we have um, a wonderful guest this evening, Gregory Jackson, that we'll be speaking to uh, shortly. Um, comes to us from the Bay Area, um, specifically ho homing in Oakland and, uh, you know, representing a, a wonderful, you know, um, a, a survey of organizations out there, Repaired Nations, um, a former fellow with the Sustainable Economies Law Center. Um, and um, yeah, and, and the, the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative. So we're really looking forward to um, speaking with our guests this evening on those uh, um, organizations that are represented. Um, but for now, um, I come to you to frame the broadcast. Uh, you are here on the Ujama Hour. Uh, the Ujama Hour is an informal, um, intimate, uh, conversational exploration of the Black social and solidarity economy. What are the solutions that uh, Black people, Black communities are using um, across the nation, uh, throughout the U.S., um, and potentially elsewhere? We have not interviewed um, outside of these borders, but, you know, it's not that we are um, without aspiration to do so. Um, but this exploration is uh, a journey of curiosity. Um, it's a curiosity for a different type of development. It's a curiosity for a different definition of development than the one um, that we are, are typically offered, right? Um, so we are offered a, a definition of development that is situated um, within capitalism, firmly within capitalism. Um, and, you know, it, it says that housing is the purview of, uh, of developers, you know, who can shave a surplus off of the, the rent increases or the value um, increase in an area. Um, it says that um, that employment is the purview of, uh, of, of large organizations that have the ability to, co to control their wage labor, right? To control um, what the wages are in a city, right? You know, who can extract uh, large uh, TIF dollars and tax, um, you know, uh, supplements um, w from bringing their business into an area, right? And we here at the Ujima Hour, we here at the Colon uh, Colonet Collaborative, um, we think that there's a different approach and a different definition that we can engage in uh, within uh, the framework of community development. And, you know, we even question and query that term development. What does that mean? Um, you know, and, and so um, we think in terms and we think in the frame of the solidarity economy um, and the solidarity economy uh, just recognizes that um, the, the approach that we should be, we, we need to democratize the economy. You know, we need to move decision making power back to the center of the, the greatest impact. Um, and, and that's in all sorts of ways. That's in the ways that we think about housing. That's in the ways that we think about um, employment and, and, and the sort of um, businesses that operate in our community. Um, and, and we need to really shift towards models that emphasize that collective, that cooperative, that shared governance. Uh, and that's uh, what we uh, intend to explore on the Ujima Hour. And that's what we have been exploring on the Ujima Hour. Uh, so we really thank you all for, for, for going on this journey with us. Um, so recently, of course, you know, we spoke with Elizabeth Carter, uh, formerly of the Urban Cooperative uh, Enterprise Legal Center, now uh, representing uh, her own firm, uh, you know, and really about the cooperative capital. So uh, so Elizabeth is, is really um, moving in that direction of, of helping um, people who are, are looking at these models of shared governance, who are looking at these models of cooperatives, um, you know, really locate the the opportunities to secure capital um, that will allow them to launch these enterprises, to launch these endeavors. Um, so, you know, if you have not heard that broadcast, please go back on the Ujima Hour, uh, pardon me, the Colonet Collaborative Facebook page and check out um, that, that last broadcast uh, with uh, Elizabeth Carter. Um, and before that, you know, um, we had the, the opportunity in June um, to talk to Lasaya Wade of Brave Space Alliance, you know, um, someone that, um, you know, I lift up as uh, as as really feeding the South Side, right? Um, so we have entered in Chicago here yet another period of civil unrest, um, and and we we know what was what was the outcome of the last period of civil unrest, and we know what the store shutdowns uh, meant for communities. And so Brave Space Alliance was uh, one of those organizations that was at the forefront, at the foreground. Um, really, you know, uh, building mutual aid solutions that that serviced uh, these areas in the South Side that 
were that had me that didn't have as uh, accomplished or, or or advanced mutual aid networks as those that have uh, you know sprung up around the north side, and you know that's really you know um, uh, a consequence of uh, of resource issues. That's a consequence of uh, neighborhood segregation dynamics, um, and just the historical segregation patterns in Chicago, um, which lead to those those resource dynamics, and so. You know, um, so but Brave Space, you know, really showed up, you know, they, they showed up uh, as an organization um, whose core mission is to really, you know, um, serve the interest of, uh, of LGBT, uh, specifically black trans, um, you know, um, communities in Chicago. Right. And and really expanding their service area, expanding their service set um, to really, you know, um, encompass a, a much broader, you know, um, array around the south side so you know that that's that's an organization that i really champion as as really um speaking to that that principle of mutualism that we see within the solidarity economy um you know recognizing that um there are mutually beneficial outcomes that we are aspiring towards and that you know um if if we can shift through some of these other dynamics that that really keep us from being in solidarity um, you know, then we can we can move towards that uh, space of shared governance, that space of cooperative um, and co cooperative and collaborative um, engagement uh, that that we um, always speak to on the on the Ushima Hour. So yes, Elizabeth Carter, Messiah Wade. Um, it's it's been a journey this year. Um, we we've had some some stellar you know guests on the broadcast, and you know we're really looking forward to to more you know um, as the year comes on. Um, so. Uh, yes, I thank you all for being with us this evening. Um, so, just kind of framing uh, where we are in this uh, this um, spectrum. So, as we enter this week, um, as I've noted, you know, um, another period of unrest, and then you know, as this broadcast was setting in, um, a tornado, you know, uh, just passed by the sort of edges of uh, Cook County, right? You know, around Will and Kendall, um, and. You know, there, there's um, there's a lot of reflection that that's um, you know available to us here, right? You know, what is the type of period of, of tumult, of turmoil that we are in, and what does it look like to to really lock arms on some of these principles of the solidarity economy and to find what it means to to cohere, to bring cohesion um, amongst one another, amongst ourselves, um, and what institutions will be built from that space. Um, so one of the things that I was really delighted to see was that uh, recently, you know, I had an opportunity to um, uh, engage with some some folks on the South Side in the 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 organization is in Inglewood, but the the co-op that they're attempting to develop will be honed in Chatham. Um, but they're attempting to develop a South Side food co-op. Uh, now, for those who have any sort of um, you know, under, understanding of the, the food co-op scene in Chicago. Um, there is no food co-op scene. Um, there is one that has been attempting to develop. Um, so certainly I had the benefit of being um, one of the members in the very last days of what was called the Hyde Park Food Co-op um, uh, there in the, the Hyde Park community on 55th Street. And, you know, an institution that had been in the community for, you know, 75 years at the time of its, um, you know, withering away. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's it's kind of like it was really one bad decision that, that caused that 75 year old institution to um, to depart from Chicago. Um, but, you know, since that time, um, Dill Pickle Food Co-op in Logan Square has really been holding down uh, the ground, holding down the fort for food cooperatives in the city. Um, and, and, you know, I recognize the sort of reputation that food co-ops have as, as sort of the capitalist of the solidarity economy in some ways, you know, as agents of gentrification. Um, as agents of, of averse, of, you know, um, you know, confrontational neighborhood dynamics, as it were, right? Um, but you know, I was really, uh, I really, you know, feel uh, great promise with the model of, of food co-ops that can develop for Black communities. Um, now, what I think that that requires is that we take a different approach to developing food co-ops than what is traditionally promoted. Um, we cannot be chasing after large footprint stores. We cannot be chasing after capital intensive projects. Um, we really have to, you know, think about our scale uh, very intentionally, um, you know, and, and really think about the replication of smaller scale stores. Um, and, and, you know, that's going to have to change some of the ways that we think about how we shop. Right. Um, you know, we, we become accustomed to thinking that, you know, we need to pursue the larger box stores because that's the experience we want to have. We want to have the, the, the plethora of options in that way. Um, but. 
I think we have to look at what's on the what are, what are the outcomes that we're after. Um, if we're after the outcomes that you know we just want to have a large footprint store in our community, um, we had that in Dominic's. And for those who remember, you know, seven years ago when Dominic's departed the entire Chicago market and left Seventy Person Jeffrey without a store for seven years, um, you know, and and certainly you know we've had that experience in the South Side as well. You know, uh, previously when we talked about on the broadcast with the departure of Target. Um, we need stores that actually where we have a locus of control that's centered in the community where the decisions that are made about how the store proceeds, how the store grows, how the store engages with the community, those decisions need to be centered within the community. And so I, I, I find great promise in the possibility of the Southside Food Co-op. And, you know, I've offered, you know, um, my insight, my assistance, my connections, you know, um, to this this budding effort. Um, you know, as, as a, you know, a member of the Dill Pickle Co-op Board, as a, you know, a board member with the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network, and as an edu educator within the New Economy Coalition Working Group, um, I want to make sure that these cooperative models flourish and thrive um, in Black communities in Chicago. And so certainly, you know, um, anytime I see an effort, I hearken out, I call out, and I try to see what I can do to assist with that effort. Um, so, yes, I, I lift up the Southside Food Co-op, and I encourage you um, to, you know, just uh, go ahead and check out their Facebook page, you know, um, you'll see that in the comments section here, um, you know, see what they're doing, fill out their survey, um, you know, and, and really, you know, see what might be done to support um, helping this effort to move with the intention and move with the, the, the um, you know, move with the shared, shared capacity um, that's available um, within communities on the South Side. So, um, I, I, you know, I lift that up as a sort of special shout out to that effort. I had an opportunity to get on their community meeting um, this this earlier this weekend. Um, and, you know, I look forward to joining them in another uh, gathering. Uh, shifting to that, um, I also want to highlight um, an upcoming project that, you know, I am d deeply excited about, Beautiful Solutions. Um, so for those who have been following the Cold Nut Collaborative Facebook page for some time, you, you know that occasionally you see these posts that have this hashtag beautiful solution associated with it. And, you know, might even have, uh, you know, in capital letters at the beginning of the, the um, caption, beautiful solutions. Um, that actually comes from um, this text um, that's, that's in development. Um, so beautiful solutions, I originally encountered it, you know, as I was... Um, at the Mapping Our, Mapping Our Futures training uh, with Highlander, they had come to the New Economy Coalition uh, member meeting uh, that was hosted in Chicago about two years ago in 2017. And um, at that time, they shared some of these, uh, these decks that it, they had been developing um, for these beautiful solutions cards that were part of the curriculum. So throughout the curriculum, communities are grappling with, you know, what economy means um, and, and, and why economy is important and why it's important for the community to have a decision uh, in how the economy is shaped. Um, and then these beautiful solutions cards are simply examples of ways that communities are asserting um, that, that shared decision-making capacity over things that are occurring in their community. Um, so, you know, when I, when I first got a hold of that deck, you know, I was deeply excited and I couldn't wait for the text to appear. Um, you know, and there's there's just been, you know, um, everyone sort of has these sort of resource challenges and dynamics. But, you know, finally, the team, um, it has been able to assemble, um, line up their publishing. And, you know, they, they've initiated a fundraiser for um, the Beautiful Solutions text. So um, so soon enough, we will get to see a finished copy in 2021 of the Beautiful Solutions text. And I encourage folks to go over there to Indiegogo. Um, and really check out, um, you know, what's what's there in terms of the text, you know, what what are the perks that they have there. Um, they are connected, you know, with a host of, uh, of other educators, you know, popular educators that, you know, I admire. Um, and, and really, you know, thinking about, again, how we show the types of examples that motivate people towards this action um, of engaging in these solidarity economy initiatives. Um, because ultimately, you know, we want people to see themselves in this future, right? We want people to see them see this type of future for themselves, and and oftentimes the way that we can do that is we can show them how these examples are um, are active on the ground, um, and so that's what the beautiful solutions text is doing. So, um, I encourage you to go ahead and take a glance at that, um, and and finally, you know, I want to plug um, this Wednesday, I will be facilitating um, a webinar um, with. Um, 
with the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives um, on behalf of um, the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network, as well as um, the Coldenet Collaborative. Um, it'll be caring for and educating our children. So in this current time, in this current crisis, in this ongoing, you know, public health crisis and economic crisis, right? Um, we are seeing families that are having to make some dramatic decisions about, you know, how to attend to the needs of their children um, as they are being, you know, nudged to go back to work, um, as they are be having to face the choice of, of you know, do we re-enroll in school? What are the decisions that the school is going to be making around the health of our, our, our children? Um, so we're going to have a webinar, you know, that's going to be devoted to that. Um, you know, I had the opportunity to speak. Um, with Ana Martina of the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives um, and Emily Kawano of the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network. And, you know, this really came together very rapidly. You know, um, there were some folks that were thinking about this on, um, collectively on the New Economy Coalition um, uh, listserv. And, you know, as we sat down to think about how we might shape a container for this conversation, um, we'll, we'll be having um, uh, Teresa Mansell from Child Space, Naomi Alexis from It Takes a City uh, NY, um, and Ellen Vera of Co-op Sensi's uh, Care Share, um, really on the line to help us collectively think through um, how we develop solutions that that highlight and emphasize cooperatives, um, but also you know that that really thinks about how we are in solidarity uh, with people who are are forced you know or or, or challenged to make other choices, right? Um, and so, you know, we want to make sure that we are not necessarily letting um, the government off the hook for the responsibility that it has to attend to a broad based, um, you know, universal child care, a broad based public education system. But we also want to make sure that, you know, uh, that 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 uh, families really have have the opportunity to think through what are the types of options that are available. And, and then, you know, effectively, we're thinking about all stakeholders here. So we're thinking about the stakeholders that are our children, families workers, right? You know, um, Child Space is a, is a worker cooperative. Um, and so, you know, all of those all of those stakeholders are important and all of them will be represented in this conversation. Uh, so so look forward to that um, Wednesday, August 12th. Um, you can register at the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperative website. And, you know, that link also will be um, in our comment section. So make sure you check that out. Um, yeah. And you know, there will be some other broadcasts that will be coming um, throughout the, the month of August and, and into September. Um, so this August 12th broadcast, um, Caring for and Educating Our Children. August 19th, Concern for Our Communities uh, Means Nobody's Left Behind. Lessons on Building Collective Safety on the 26th. And then September 2nd, Transformation Beyond Perennial Economic Crisis. All of these emphasizing the cooperative aspect, the cooperative solutions that are available to us and that we, we should be lifting up in this moment of crisis because, you know, it, it, the, the, all crises represent that, in, that point of intervention. Um, so it's a point that we can go either way. Um, and, you know, we, we certainly, um, you know, want to go in a different direction um, than we, we have been heading in with, um, you know, the various forms of uh, de deregulation and neoliberalism and, 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 and the sort, um, we have the opportunity to develop solutions that emphasize um, and center our community's needs, our community's desires, our community's aspirations, um, self-determination, autonomy, and all of the sort. Um, so I look forward to having you all on that broadcast. Um, and, you know, that's, uh, you know, finally, I'll just end with this allied me media uh, image in solidarity economy, relationships are our greatest currency. Um, and that's what we believe here at the Colonet Collaborative. That's what the Colonet Collaborative is about. It's a piece of infrastructure, and it's a piece of infrastructure that lays on top of the relationships we already have developed uh, to ultimately allow us to, to exchange uh, service and skills where time is the currency, relationships are the currency. We want to build uh, let relational tethers between uh, organizations and individuals and neighborhoods in Chicago and uh, that's what we will continue doing. And, you know, we welcome you to that broadcast. Uh, so now um, we, we go ahead and open the floor for our, our, our guest of honor. Um, we'll be bringing on here uh, Gregory Jackson. Uh, Gregory Jackson is a project lead of Repaired Nations, 2018 Equal Justice Works Legal Fellow with Sustainable Economies Law Center, uh, an Oakland native with a family history um, in the city that spans three generations. Uh, committed to achieving economic equity in the East Bay through collective ownership and democ democratic decision making. Um, you know, I had the opportunity to um, encounter uh, his work um, through, uh, through
improve uh, my awareness of the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative. Uh, and, and then later, you know, we, we were able to exchange on some of the work that um, he is doing uh, through, uh, through book study, collective study um, with Repaired Nations, uh, and, and share some of the work that's happening with the Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group. Uh, so, you know, I, I am, uh, you know, um, honored and appreciate, you know, his presence on the broadcast. And I will now go ahead and open up the scene for uh, Greg Jackson. So uh, welcome to the broadcast, Greg. Hey, greetings, Mike. Uh, thanks for having me on uh, this uh, Cola Nut uh, special. It's, uh, I mean, I love the work that you all are doing and was excited when I met uh, in Wisconsin and, and have been learning and uh, trying to stay connected. So uh, really happy to keep building bridges across the nation uh, for cooperatives. Excellent, excellent. So, uh, yeah, you know, so welcome um, to the broadcast. So in terms of how, so I, I always like to begin with this question that's sort of uh, the, 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 the ramp, you know, the runway up to where you are now. Um, so, you know, now you're, you know, this uh, Equal Justice Fellow um, with, uh, with SELP, um, you're with Repaired Nations. What's the runway that gets you up to this point? You know, what, what's, your, what's your life uh, been like thus far that actually brought you to this point? Um, well, <laughs> I was, I was a jock until college when I uh, decided to take philosophy and started learning a lot about, um, economies and politics and like the theory behind it. And, um, like wanted to figure out a way to make a difference besides just like taping ankles. <laughs> um, and so, uh, after college, uh, graduating from San Diego state, um, I was able to intern a bunch, um, returning back to um, to the Bay Area, um, and through the Community Democracy Project, which is um, still going on, it's like 10 years strong, trying to change the city charter in Oakland to get participatory democracy. Um, I was involved in about 2012, um, and uh, one of my colleagues uh, told me I should check out Sustainable Economies Law Center. Um, and luckily, I was able to um, speak with uh, Christina, um, who was there early on, and um, it gave me the ability to, as a law student, um, help fix some of the more systemic problems rather than putting band-aids on, um, like landlords, um, ripping people off and cashing places, ripping people off. Like <clears throat> that's just a symptom of, um, our economic exploitation. So, uh, coming into the law center and learning about what's going on in Europe and Italy and Spain, I uh, was really inspiring for me. And it felt like, if we really put our efforts into it, it could be something that could um, revolutionize the way we see the workplace and the way we uh, interact with each other. And so um, I wanted to you know, devote my life really and, and my energy towards uh, bringing that up. Absolutely. And so um, in terms of your, your, um, your family within Oakland, you know, what's, what's the, is there something specific about, you know, this sort of generational, um, you know, dynamic that your relationship with Oakland that that drives you to um, to dig at these solutions, to pursue these? Um, <clears throat> well, we've been dealing with gentrification here for a while, and I know a lot of cities have. Uh, but I guess uh, also coming to the understanding that if we don't fix it here, then the people who have to escape like exploitative rent prices are going to move somewhere else. And then they're going to make those people move. And it's just going to be like a domino effect um, in for lack of a better word. So uh, what we want to do here in Oakland um, is do our best to ground the people who have been here, who have helped create the culture that has made Oakland what it is, um, rather than I'm um, allowing for a new generation uh, to come in, kind of claim that legacy um, and then like disperse um, like the great vibes and and uh, energy that's been building up here. Um, and so it used to be like nearly 50% of uh, Oakland's population was black. Now it's less than 25, uh, hurtling down to like 15. Um, and yeah, like every year you can feel the city changing. Um, and, it, and it really hurts to know that like, you know, the folks down the street aren't there anymore. And now it's painted black and gray because there's a new person coming in. And that's, <laughs> I kind of see that as like, okay, new person, black and gray. That's, they got the Black Lives Matter sign. Like they, they think they're with it. Um, however, yeah, there's just a lot of, a lot of folks who 
um, we're forced here because of economic migration and, you know, the cycle continues. Absolutely. Um, so why don't you give uh, folks a survey of the projects that, that are currently, you know, securing your attention and just kind of, you know, elaborate on what those projects are, are, are doing um, inside of this? Yeah. Um, so early on in my fellowship, um, I started working with the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative, uh, which is seeking to take land off the speculative market um, and doing it through a multi-stakeholder cooperative uh, that has uh, resident owners and investor owners, community owners and staff owners. And uh, over the course of two years, we've been able to like build up to 250 plus members um, in all of those different categories um, combined. And uh, the co-op just received a property um, donated by someone who believed in the mission and wanted to keep it off the speculative market. Uh, the co-op has uh, secured a, like a fourplex that is kept um, like cooperators and lawyers and educators uh, um, grounded um, in their place in North uh, Oakland. Um, and uh, EBPREC has also, well, has just ended a series of scenario planning calls where we've been working with the community to understand what the needs are and how the cooperative can situate itself so that uh, when property prices uh, continue to fall and reach like rock bottom, when people are forced to be evicted from their homes, uh, EVPREC could hopefully um, have uh, done enough organizing and done enough um, organizing within the community and within like institutional um, investors to have gotten the money to like have kept a large amount of us um, grounded, which is our goal. Um, also involved with the East Oakland Grocery Cooperative, which has uh, gathered together a group, a cohort of five people, um, partnering with Acton on Verba, which has a, a an urban farm and a youth uh, program, uh, Mandela Grocery, and Repair Nations to support this cohort through a 12-week training, <clears throat> so that um, at the end of it they can start a their own grocery cooperative in East Oakland, <clears throat> and. Uh, it's really interesting uh, because everyone is from East Oakland, they've made choices that uh, others may not have. <clears throat> For example, in Oakland, between 72nd Avenue and 103rd, I believe, uh, is what we call Deep East Oakland. It's where, uh, like, historically, a lot of the murders have happened. It's where a lot of the poverty is. And that's exactly where they want to put that grocery store, <laughs> something that anyone else from outside wouldn't, wouldn't do. And so... Uh, just really powerful in that sense. Uh, we've been able to work with uh, Cooperation Richmond um, to uh, get an invitation into the Seed Commons. And so Repaired Nations um, will be joining a national financial cooperative network and be able to bring financial support to these cooperatives that we're helping to generate here in East Oakland. Um, we've been working on a real estate project um, that uh, is partnering with the Black Cultural Zone. Um, the Black Cultural Zone is a collaborative of um, community organizations and uh, developers seeking to um, like bring the folks who have been there in East Oakland, uh, the Black Cultural Zone, um, together and do neighborhood planning. Um, uh, the Black Cultural Zone has secured a, <clears throat> a site at a, a local mall where we're doing um, food distribution um, three times a week, I think like 5,000 meals um, per distribution. Um, they're also looking at uh, where we can activate cultural hubs along corridors uh, where the highest concentrations of black folks are. Um, and so it seems like every day there's uh, something new and exciting happening, right? And because Repaired Nations has been doing this Collective Courage book club on Instagram Live for the past 11 weeks and uh, giving people a viewpoint into the deep tradition of uh, black cooperatives, more people are letting us know that they're interested, they want to talk, figure out how they can make this work for uh, their visions. And so, um, yeah, we're just like really knee deep in, in outreach and uh, technical assistance right now. Okay. And, um, and so I, I know that um, you, you've mentioned Repaired Nations doing the Instagram book club. Um, I have seen, you know, some of the other um, Black Cooperative Economics salons, you know, that, that have happened. Um, so talk about, you know, the, the relationship between like political education study and, you know, and the sort of organizing work that, that you all are, are, are doing in, in, or in Oakland and the Bay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, we think it's important to stand on the shoulders of those who have done this before us. Um, and it actually, like, 
when folks know that we've been doing this since the 1700s and they get a, and they get to see like all of the different kinds of cooperative, it actually expands our mind and allows for us to think like, oh, if I could just gather up my friends, like we can all like start this buying club or whatever. Um, the political education kind of, uh, we weave that into the uh, Collective Courage book as we're going along uh, because <laughs> it, it will, it exemplifies how, um, if there's an outside political force or uh, maybe a physically violent force um, that is uh, coming against you um, and threatening not just like your civil rights, but your life, like you have to take certain steps. Um, and so um, like co-ops have been used to like as anti-oppression tools really um, since their beginning. And it's important to keep that link strong, letting folks know that um, we don't have to go with the extractive principles we've been taught like we can actually go to the pre-colonial harmonious way that we have done business. Um, and we don't have to, we don't have to, it, I mean, it's all a choice, right? Um, the way that we engage in this uh, economy is a choice and we can choose to like go to home Depot and in and out burger and support the corporations that are giving Trump money. Or we can choose to like go to our local cooperatives and uh, spend our money. Like uh, in my case at Mandela grocery, because I know that money is going to, uh, the the community and to people who are helping to bring the services to the community that we need. I mean, that's really what we need to be thinking about. Um, it's both a like lifestyle shift with the way we deal with our money, but also a mindset shift because um, whether we like it or not, our choices with our money um, have like far reaching impacts and we have to be conscious of that. Yes. And so on this broadcast, we've talked, um, you know, throughout these sort of intersecting crises, you know, of, uh, of civil unrest and public health um, crises about how the cooperatives in Chicago have, have show, shown up, you know. So we've got um, uh, Shy Fresh Kitchen, uh, you know, which, you know, certainly, you know, very clearly touts itself as owned by, you know, formerly incarcerated uh, black women. Um, and, and, you know, they have shown up as, you know, a significant force on mutual aid for food delivery. Um, so you know, is there a narrative, is there a story about how cooperatives have shown up in, in this crisis in, in Oakland or in the Bay Area? Um, <clears throat> well, the biggest, like, cooperative association here in the Bay Area is Ares Mindy, and they have about, like, uh, eight or ten different uh, places around. Um, and to my knowledge, they haven't really had a, uh, they haven't been able to address uh, the crisis um, as we would have preferred. However, there has been like this increased or like really wonderful resurgence of mutual aid by uh, like everyday folks as well as like people in the cooperative movement who like don't have jobs anymore because they're not essential, right? And so, um, yeah, there's been lots of uh, like, for example, the Black Earth Farms, which is um, in uh, where they're nearby in the Bay Area, near Wild and Radish Farms, and uh, they do CSA boxes where um, they're, if you can't pay, they're going to, like, give you some of that food anyway. Um, there's, I mean, uh, also in Oakland, uh, a really interesting case of mutual aid, or maybe it's donation, is um, because of all of the protests and the outcry and all of the broken windows and things like that, um, there was um, like a fund put together to help those black businesses, which is also a form of mutual aid, right? Um, there's, I mean, there's tons of instances of people coming together and doing what they can to, to uh, bring folks through. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so we, we've talked in this broadcast previously with Yavet Holtz, uh, Cowrie Village, Bay Area Organization of Black-Owned Businesses. Are you connected? Does that... Yeah, 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 like, yeah, that's awesome. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, yeah, you know, uh, alumni of, of the, the Ujima Hour, so, you know, uh, welcome to that. Um, so the, the pilot program that it talks about you developing out of the Equal Justice Fellow, uh, you know, um, program was a, a youth, youth focus, you know, um, cooperative or, or sort of what's the, you know, one, I want to kind of ask you, what was that pilot program? Is that Repaired Nations? And then also, you know, do you feel like you have a focus on youth, you know, in terms of how your cooperative work? Yeah, um, well, the first uh, pilot program for youth that I did was at um, a charter school in Berkeley called Realm Charter School. 
Um, and I was going through this process of introducing the kids to cooperatives, um, seeing where their interests lie. Um, and then during the summer, uh, like direct them to a place where they can gather the skills they needed so that the next year we could start creating a co-op. Um, I got them as far as placing them in a, uh, a place to get the skills, <clears throat> but unfortunately uh, leadership changed and we didn't continue. Um, but most recently, uh, two years ago, um, we were focused really on uh, folks that are between, well, as low as 18, but really like 21 to 26. Um, uh, our audience tends to be like 26 to 35. Um, and we believe that this particular group of people are the ones that we need to um, be reaching, <laughs> the millennials, the ones who are now the biggest age group in the U.S., the uh, the ones who are going to be uh, taking us through whatever happens during the next few decades. Uh, these are the people that need to know about co-ops. And so um, last year we were able to gather eight uh, multidisciplinary artists, uh, black artists, um, <clears throat> and uh, invite them in to teach with us and co-facilitate our um, education. So the book clubs and the workshops. Um, they also uh, came with us on our trip to Ghana during the year of return. Um, and so we got to like expose them to a lot of different uh, kinds of cooperatives. And because we were able to get uh, people to come with us from different parts of the country, uh, like Chicago and Jackson, we were also exposing them to, you know, uh, like just different forms of cooperatives and all the different flavors that uh, they may arise. Um, and since that point, we've been able to get three people uh, placed into a cooperative job. Um, one person is deepening their uh, like music collective and starting to understand how to govern that better. Um, and um, <clears throat> one of the folks is inside of the East Oakland Grocery Co-op, one of their founding members. Um, and so it was kind of a slow process where I didn't necessarily know what I wanted them to do except learn about co-ops and find their own way. And I think each has really. And so like the network of Bay Area worker co-ops and No Boss and uh, Cooperation Richmond all have um, representatives from that cohort um, a couple of years ago. Absolutely. Um, what was your favorite part of the year of return? You know, I'd actually forgot, you know, about mm -hmm. the, the, the initiative before to, to put it on the question night. So thank you for lifting it up. Yeah. Um, I just love being in seas of black people and feeling like no one's judging me except acknowledging my presence and welcoming me there. Um, and whenever I like travel overseas and go into Africa, that's how I feel. Um, and I don't like, you know, the spider, the spidey tingles, <laughs> the spidey senses we have around racism aren't like uh, prickling. Um, and that's the, that's the best part. Um, the coastlines are like amazing. Um, and like the people are super welcoming. Um, <laughs> Sometimes they're just trying to sell you things, but for the most part, it's just like, it feels, uh, it just felt like a homecoming. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone who came kind of, we really just got to sink our, our toes into the red soil and um, thank the ancestors that we made it back and got to um, say hello. And yeah, that, that intangible thing. <laughs> yes, yes. And so you've already talked about, you know, from the folks uh, who take this trip on the year of return, you know, um, across the, you know, folks from across the nation, um, you know, take this year of return to Ghana. Um, they come back. Some of the folks are getting, you know, placed within cooperatives. I've heard, you know, uh, Renee and Stacy talk about, you know, a Pan-African Solidarity Economy Network. I, I don't know if that's a sort of conversation that was happening there as well. Yeah. <clears throat> so at the conference. About 150 people came both uh, day, well, uh, total over the course of two days. Um, and during the last day, we got to discuss with uh, the people we brought from the U.S. and the Ghanaians and uh, the person from Ivory Coast and Benin. Um, <clears throat> we were able to discuss, like, what do we want to build together and what would that look like? Um, it was titled the Pan-African Solidarity Economy Network. Um, and it had uh, three... Um, overviews or uh, headlines. Uh, the first is uh, communications um, and figuring out how uh, we can like share our skills and talents with each other um, as well as be in constant communication. Um, there was also a request for monthly educational programming so that we can all um, 
build up our skills together. Um, and then there was also talks about um, short-term projects and long-term projects. Everyone had their eye on, like, how do we come together and co-develop this land <clears throat> cooperatively? Um, we got to learn that there are tons of chiefs in um, West Africa. Um, we were in Ghana specifically who are seeking to give their land away <clears throat> to African-Americans that are returning. And so it was really eye-opening to see that if we, if we, if we wanted to, if we were able to, you know, uh, gather the wherewithal and maybe the community we needed to feel comfortable um, integrating with theirs, like we could really create a city um, on the coast of, of West Africa, and that land would be given to us to uh, work with our our, uh, our diasporan brothers over there. Um, yeah, and so we're still building that out. Um, uh, Kana. Um, who um, has been an amazing coordinator, is hosting um, what we're calling Less Build pre-conference sessions every last, sun Saturday, or every last Sunday of the month at 12 noon, um, where we're bringing together pods from across the country and uh, even across the globe. Uh, Ghana was our first one. Um, and bringing folks together to have conversations about the cooperative principles and what that means in daily life as we build up to this uh, conference where, we'll, where we will continue the conversation of a Pan-African Solidarity Economy Network and how we can continue building that up. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so uh, a small pivot to your, your subtitle on the uh, East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative Board is Governance Expert or Governance uh, yeah, I am uh, officially the governance director. Um, in, our, in EB Prex bylaws, we decided that the president of the board would be called the governance director or the governance owl. Okay. Um, so uh, there was an election earlier this year, um, and I was I uh, was elected um, into that role. Um, and so, yeah, I mean. <laughs> that's that's why the title is there, but it fits because um, on my mind always is how do we make decisions with each other? How do we set up the right governance structures, the right um, expectations that we share with each other so we can move forward um, in an easeful way? Because uh, if, you, <laughs> if you don't have those things in place, it's really obvious. <laughs> but if you do, everything just moves smoothly and you don't really notice. And so I've been doing my best to like learn how to get people on that page where let's just get on the same page with governance. Like if you got this purpose and, and list of responsibilities, let's write it down so that there isn't any, uh, there doesn't have to be any vagueness uh, around that. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I certainly, you know, have been in, in, in a bit of a governance study myself. Oh, so I'm just, I, I, I started with, you know, a few different texts on consensus and then, you know, I, I it's just spread out, you know, and I, and, and I've, I've actually been, you know, pitching to everyone that like, look, you know, even if you don't want to use consensus in your organization, just read the manuals, because ultimately thinking about meeting processes gets you in this habit of saying, you know what, there's a way to plan for a, a good session. And, you know, and there's a way to design a good session so that like we can figure out how to get everybody in the room, you know, like really in the room. Um, so is, is there, do you have a particular, you said governance owl, owl. I'm wondering, you know, I know that I was recently, you know, uh, studying with um, Starhawk, you know, uh, on the, the, the empowering collaborative groups and they had the mandala of different animals. Is the owl something like that? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think the owl specifically is a, a quirk from one of our coworkers. They like to put the like positions as <laughs> just, helps them with it, and uh, the owl represents oversight. Okay, excellent. Yeah. excellent. Okay, so um, let's dig, dig a little bit into um, um, East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative. Um, well, one, you know, what was your first interaction or engagement with the organization that, that's made you say, you know what, one, I want to be on this board, and then eventually I want to, you know, run to, for the, the, you know, one of the officer seats? Um. So I've been a real estate developer at heart um, before I was <laughs> before I was at EB Prec. Um, in 2016, I was hoping that um, through Repair Nations we could uh, start a um, like an eco village of cooperatives in uh, in Nairobi, um, just outside of Nairobi, Nairobi. I'm at this awesome place called Whistling Thorns. 
Um, I tried to do more real estate development at uh, Eastmont Mall, where the Black Cultural Zone currently is. There's a defunct theater um, that hasn't been used since the 90s and was trying to get into that space to open up something for the community. Didn't work out. Um, and uh, I guess through trial and error, I've realized that um, if we can group not just our resources, but our talents together, we can create an organization that is able to be the backbone for many organizations and can lay the groundwork so that it becomes progressively easier for us to get a community development projects through. Because uh, at the moment, um, like uh, <laughs> at the moment, uh, Repair Nations is still looking at real estate projects and wanting to um, currently see, trying to create a cooperative corridor on the Foothill Boulevard um, in East Oakland uh, called uh, Oconda. And um, we're told by many institutions that uh, they love our mission and our values and the way that we're doing it. However, it's very tough to get commitments. Um, and when we do get to that commitment phase, they ask, even though they know where we're at, um, so do you have someone who's credit worthy who can help with this? <laughs> um, and so uh, it, it's, it's very frustrating. But that's one of the reasons why EVPREC was formed, so that um, as this one organization um, continues to create a foundation for itself um, and the community, um, we can take up properties through that, um, through EBPREC for Repaired Nations, for Black Cultural Zone, for anyone, um, and hopefully um, short circuit that uh, block to getting the capital we need to develop our own communities. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, so sidebar question, I think, um, is it Zach Murray who's with the one of the land trusts out there? Is that... Uh... Yeah, yeah, he was with Oak CLT for some time. Okay. Yeah, so um, he was on a, on a land trust call with the um, National Public Housing Museum here. And, you know, I was I, I pitched a question about the POC Sustainable Housing Network. I'm, I'm just wondering what's your opinion about the impact or the effect of having an organization that's focused on, you know, getting people together to talk about housing issues on the sort of number of land trust and various health cooperative initiatives that are happening there in the, along the coast. Um, well, like you said, like uh, cooperatives are a lot, a very relationship heavy, relationship based. Um, and so um, <clears throat> it's something you can't necessarily get around. Like you got to get to know the people um, and it's better to know them beforehand. So you know what to look out for um, before you get into the thing. So in, in that vein, like the potion has been very, very helpful um, for having that source of communication where we can like send out um, if like housing co-ops are on the market and we can get uh, more people of color into those or uh, people can gather and have a meal when it was <laughs> when that was available to us um, and talk about you know um, what's next um, and I think that I mean I, th I think every co-op developer does that relationship stewarding in some way um, and so if there's a if there's an organization that's already there and committed to doing it it helps everyone out. It helps the ecosystem out as a whole. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, what's been the greatest uh, challenge in, in sort of all of the work that you're, you're doing? I mean, besides the current obvious one of like, we can't meet, you know, we, we, we love to be in person, but you know, what, what's been the, the greatest challenge that you've experienced in this, this scope of work you're doing? Oh, uh, the financing thing is really, uh, really kicking my butt right now. <laughs> Uh, before this, I was actually feeling deflated because, yeah, some things aren't working out quite how we projected. Um, I, I think the hardest part about this pandemic um, isn't the work, or at least for me, because I'm able to do a lot of this stuff from home. But it's like the uh, emotional and spiritual maintenance that um, I have to keep up to stay in a good mood and stay um, on top of everything, um, needing to like create boundaries so that I'm not uh, working all day or not eating all day because I'm too focused on work. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it's been both a blessing because it has provided some time to like reflect. Um, and also, 
I don't know if this has happened to you, but the uh, for a really long stretch of time, the video meeting, uh, <laughs> it was just too much. <laughs> it, everyone was like, I think every organization realized everyone was home. So we can just have a bunch of meetings <laughs> because everybody's home. All you got to do is push the button. You're just switching from one, one ID to the next. <laughs> yeah. And uh, whoa, that I think that ran everyone ragged for a moment. So we're like, you know, trying to get some sun, take some time and, and uh, be intentional about what the next steps are moving forward. Yeah. We were doing a check-in for, um, what was it? The narrative. So the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network has a, a narrative meeting on alternating Fridays and we were doing a check-in and, you know, folks were like, yeah, so, you know, just check in. How have you been doing? And I was like, well, look, you know, I just came off my porch. I was sitting on my porch listening to a podcast where Doug Hinwood was talking about the value of doing nothing. And, you know, someone was on the on the call, like, he said, do nothing. And I'm like, well, he said more than that, but, you know, mostly, um, you know, because, yeah, I mean, I, I value just like walking out my door and, you know, I walk through my grass, I, you know, do something that I have not ever done, you know, I guess maybe I, I walk out and, you know, I pick up trash from the street, you know, I mean, which is, you know, I mean, I've never necessarily had time because I haven't sat in my community for this long, you know, for a stretch, but it, it's, it's been very valuable for that purpose of just like being out there. I walk in the backyard of my garden, I get on my bike and I, you know, ride around the neighborhood, come back. So yeah, you know, it's it's uh, you know, the cabin fever is is definitely very real and you know, the zoom fatigue is very real, but you know, yeah, inter intervening in that is is important. Um so, you know, what um if you had to define maybe your theory of change uh, of of what, you know, what you are t attempting to set in place, you know, you've got a couple of different pieces in motion. Um, and, you know, you're imagining what your future is. In fact, we did this activity at the Dill Pickle. It was Imagine Dill Pickle 2030. So when you're looking, and I, I know you all got that Afrofuturistic graphic, you know, packet that you put out for our uh, fair nations. So what's the sort of 2030, 2040 that you're imagining and that your work is um, kind of angling towards? Um, <clears throat> we have to create cooperative ecosystems, um, creating silos of cooperatives that have no connections. I don't think that's very helpful. Um, and so um, what we've been seeking to do at Repaired Nations um, is um, show people the way, uh, let people know that this is our past, you, could, you should reclaim it. Um, getting together our education and technical assistance. Um, so giving people the one-on-one uh, -on -one workshops. Um, if people want more information, setting up the one-on-ones so that we can you know, help them walk through it. Um, we know that here in the Bay Area, as well as other places, um, it's often the finances that are the most difficult part for any startup business, let alone a cooperative, which a lot of banks don't understand. Um, and so uh, being connected to the Seed Commons gives us that, um, that ability to, to bring in uh, capital uh, to water our community. Um, and so what right now we're seeking to create those cooperatives we can point to that our community can get inspired by so that uh, when they're inspired, they're walking into an ecosystem that can support them in the ways that they need. Um, and I'm mostly thinking about uh, like coaching, credit consulting, um, like the business consulting, um, financial consulting, but also recognizing that, you know, sometimes that might mean like some other kind of social service. We're not there yet, but recognizing that that too is a thing. Um, and so we're, we're doing our best, um, to create an ecosystem where any black person who walks into our development center, which will be around in 2030, um, will have all, will have the menu of options they need to start their business. Um, and they won't feel like anything is for lack. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it starts one at a time, but it's also recognizing where the synergies are so that, yeah, like for instance, the, uh, the cooperative development center that we're seeking to launch, um, we're talking with both the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative and with uh, the Black Cultural Zone um, to see how they can help us steward this property and ensure that it doesn't go onto the speculative market, either through ground leases or through um, purchase options, those kinds of things. Um, 
And yeah, I think, I think once, once we are able to create a microcosm of an ecosystem um, by the end of this year, I think we'll have that. Um, then we'll be able to start like really um, cycling people up through our processes um, into the businesses that they want. Um, and so 2030, um, unlimited imagination, I think, is what we're seeking. Um, and unlimited cooperative imagination, I should qualify it because <laughs> there's a, a lot of imaginative exploitation. Um, but I don't know. Um, the ability or... Yeah, the ability to like see in someone's eyes when like they feel empowered and when they're like, oh, I can see where I can go and it's possible is like, that's what makes it all worth it. Um, but until like we're able to get to that 2030, 2040 space, um, we're just doing our best to um, yeah, work with the people that can see it's possible now so that they can continue modeling out that possibility for others. And then uh, conversely, you know, we've we've driven the time machine, you know, forward in future. What's the sort of uh, historical, you know, precedent, the, the tradition, um, the co the favorite cooperative that you've dug up in the sort of radical history of black cooperation that you're leaning on, you know, that as as uh, as your, you know, your pinnacle? Uh, I think there are three. Um, the Chesapeake Marine Railway and Dry Docks Company um, is super inspiring. And it was basically like a bunch of black businessmen in the 1800s giving, I guess I'll call them white people, the middle finger. <laughs> I've been saying, no, we're going to do this and ground our people. Um, the Young Negro Cooperatives League um, and the five-year plan that they had uh, to go from study circles to buying clubs to co-ops to credit unions to, uh, to la um, um, I don't want to say laboratories, but, it, you know, uh, factories. That was, like, super inspiring. Um, and, like, yeah, I can see how that launched Ella Jo Baker into the awesome career that she had. Um, and the last is uh, <clears throat> the consumer trading co company of Gary, Indiana, who, during the time of, like, depression, like, created a five-year plan um, to get a grocery store and a gas station and a credit union, um, and they did it. Um, and unfortunately, it failed um, about uh, less than a decade later. But it's it's a it's an example of a community coming together and providing for themselves um, what they need, um, and inspiring others across the country to do the same thing. The book talks about how like many folks from the South came to Gary to learn, and they brought that information back. Um, and so, yeah, those that's those are the ones that uh, really stick stick home. Yes. Yes. And, and I always lean on, um, you know, uh, the just kind of I always nudge the Free African Union Society, mostly because, you know, um, I remember a moment where I was. Um, so when I joined the Dill Pickle Board back in November, I had an opportunity to go in December to um, a Columinate training, which is like their Co-op 101 board director training. And, you know, I mean, they they were they were teaching the very typical history of Rochdale and, you know, in the 1800s and the Industrial Revolution. And, you know, just to kind of, I mean, just situate that room and just continue to situate that room. I mean, you know, being black in any, any sort of predominantly white narrative, right, just kind of disrupting that narrative in that moment and saying, like, look, yeah, I mean, you can talk about Rochdale, but I mean, you know, the African Union Society was doing this in 1780. So, I mean, you can situate wherever you want these cooperative <laughs> principles as in the inception, the origin point. But, hey, I, I can I can take you back. And, you know, and I remember um, having um, uh, Dr. Kamal Rashid on this broadcast and he talked about uh, we, we talked about the Maroon Societies and just, you know, the, the notions that when when black people, you know, escaped uh, out of out of the, those enslaved conditions, um, they didn't go and create the same societies that they were living under. They created something different. So, you know, um, carrying these principles in our body, in our blood and, and, and sort of being embodied here. Um, I think is definitely a critical uh, narrative to, sh to, to share. Um, yeah, so so I'll, I'll, I'll pause on the questions for a moment just so that we can, uh, you know, uh, invite the, the, the folks who are viewing. Um, if there are questions that you have for, for Greg Jackson, please make sure that you go ahead and put them in the comment section. Um, you know, it's been a very robust conversation so far. And so I, I just want to, um, you know, at this point, just kind of highlight to you all that uh, Co-op for Live is still meeting every other Sunday. Um, 
So make sure that you uh, do check out, uh, and, and somehow I've lost my, um, there we go. <laughs> lost my scene. Um, so cooperation, proliferation, study, and working group. We do meet on alternating Sundays. Uh, we did meet this past Sunday for our public meeting. Uh, so in two weeks, um, we will be back again um, for uh, another meeting. So um, be, be uh, sure to join us, you know, on those alternating Sundays. That's going to be August uh, 23rd um, that we'll be meeting again, um, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Um, uh, find on find us on Facebook. You know you can find the event there. Um, we we've just finished our cooperative curriculum, uh, and we be we'll be going actually into the study of um, Barbara Ransby's biography on Ella Baker. Um, so we are really you know we also you know are are, are very uh, you know um, rooted in the, the tradition of uh, of Ella Jo Baker and the sort of uh, cooperative leadership, the collective leadership, the collective governance that uh, she represents. Um, so yes, you know, be, be sure to join us uh, on the, on that Sunday. Um, as we dig into that text, um, yes, and and uh, and and I will um, defer to uh, to the listeners, you know, who have any sort of questions that you might have um, about the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative, um, about repaired nations, um, about the Sustainable Economies Law Center, about these models, about the year of return, you know, um, or, or that vision of the the, the Pan African Solidarity Economy Network um, that you know uh, Greg has has uh, has rooted us in so richly. Um, so while that, while folks are, are, are lining up there, um, who are, are you excited to talk to, um, you know, about the, the solidarity economy? Who, what, what are the, the, the most exciting conversations that you're having that you're involved in right now? Um, I was, uh, very, uh, honored to, uh, like facilitate a discussion between, uh, East Oakland Grocery Cooperative and, <clears throat> excuse me. And Jessica Gordon Emhart um, on Saturday, last Saturday. <clears throat> it's always a joy to speak with her because she carries so much knowledge with her. Um, and um, Krishna, one of the cohort members, um, asked Dr. Nimhart, um, he said he understood why co ops were something that like the black people can get into, um, like during the time of slavery and such, because, you know, it was a way for us to take care of each other. But he, he wanted to know why in this century it's still a pressing thing um and ultimately we talked about how co-ops are anti-oppression um and how um, they don't perpetuate um this exploitative mess that we're used to um and just as you said like if you're trying to get out of something don't rebuild it <laughs> when you go to a new place you gotta you gotta change it out change the water do whatever um and so um yeah that that's always uh uh, like close to my heart. I think that um, some of the hardest conversations uh, or like most interesting conversations, I should say, um, that I've had over the past couple months is talking with the group of folks that we've been organizing to purchase this building together um, and, and understanding, like getting to know each other over Zoom, <laughs> um, understanding where each person is coming from. Um, and also, it's, it's um every i guess every like cooperative venture is a little bit different like even if we had a blueprint like i don't think we would have followed it um but it's it's just amazing that at the end of this process it's looking like our project might fall out of escrow however um all of the leaders who have stepped up and helped are just uh like glowing with how much they've learned yeah. and they feel like oh well we'll get the next one because we know all this stuff now and, and that's kind of what Dr. Nemhart talks about in her book is that like, even if it's a failure, we're still like failing forward yeah. and there's like a lot to be said for what was done. Yes. Yeah. I, I certainly, you know, um, have often thought about that concept talked about in the text, you know, social energy, you know, just the I mean, the capacity of coming together and, you know, and and. I mean, yeah, and sometimes it is peak. It is, it is, it is great. There's, there's, there's the high, um, and then sometimes it's not. You know, I mean, sometimes there's a that's a really long meeting, and it's uh, it's 45 minutes too long. You know, um, and you're trying to figure out like what did we do wrong? You know, I thought we were there, <laughs> but I mean, you know, just that 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 continuous process. Um, you know, and, and do do you have any particular what are your favorite sort of facilitation practices like coming into space and helping people? You've mm -hmm. talked about helping people glue themselves together or get, get the group together. What are your sort of favorite practices for helping a group to kind of vibe? 
I love creating I love creating silly check-in questions <laughs> because if you start off a meeting smiling and laughing, it usually goes a little bit better. Um, but I've noticed like it's kind of 50-50 if you do the standard like, all right, give us a high from the day and a low from the day. You know, people <laughs> people can bring in whatever, and it you know you know you might not be able to shake that off at the beginning of the meeting, but you know if it's something silly like you know if you were a flying piece of fruit what fruit would that be <laughs> like it gives people a chance to like you know explain why they said their random thing and we all get the chance to laugh and you know that's been that's been really helpful um i think we always go in circles or at least we try to instead of like doing the popcorn thing um so that you have to tell us you don't want to say anything rather than like assuming you don't want to say anything um and uh yeah, I mean, those are the two ones. Those are the two things that I lean on the heaviest, like making sure everyone's voice is getting in the room, um, both at the check-in and you know as we're discussing things. Um, even if they say that they want to pass, like you know, at least we gave them a chance to speak. Um, I well, so I'm going to pitch to you one of the the, the check-in questions I used recently, you know, which I'm I'm interested in. So I, I was facilitating uh, um, an offers and needs market facilitation training. And, you know, um, one of the things that I opened that training with was my facilitation lineage, you know, which were all of the people who impacted me and did, shaped, you know, how I now facilitate. Because I, I also love, you know, disruptive or reflective check in questions. Um, so do you have a facilitation lineage? Are there people who have impacted you like circle trainings and things like that you've sat on or whatever? Yeah, I think uh, Kiran, Kiran Nagam, uh, she used to be at Aorta, um, Chris Tittle at um the law center mazin jamal with uh holistic underground uh i think those are like the most recent ones uh that i've kind of been influenced by mm -hmm. yeah yeah you know and i, I was highlighting like jennifer Vietz. that was the first person that i sat on a peace circle with you know and just kind of went around and then i helped to facilitate one that you know was relating um peace circle to uh social economy and you know and, and so yeah, I mean, there there was that. There was I I sat on one of the very early emergent strategy uh, pieces that uh, Major Mary Brown did here in 2015, and that impacted me. And I used that zine for years afterwards until the book came out. So yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's yeah. definitely you know the lineage uh, was, and it was a it was a it was wonderful question to kind of get people reflecting on different lineages, you know, because I talked about facilitation lineage, someone else talked about you know another you know organizing lineage and things like that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the cool thing about co-ops is like there are all of these like uh, soft skills that we learn yeah. um, that are like super super helpful. Um, like until you're in the process of trying to like make decisions together, um, one might never like learn facilitation unless they're being groomed to be a manager, right? Um, you're just told to like take decisions or like if you don't like it, you know that you can like make noise or whatever, but. There's, there is an art to like bringing people through a decision yeah. um, and it takes practice. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, in the, the, the sort of six minutes that we have left, um, you know, if you were like uh, nudging someone who's like reflecting, who's doing, doing this thinking about, you know, um, engaging in a cooperative endeavor, getting a group together, you know, what's your quick hit on, on how uh, folks get started? Uh, start with people that you know. Um, uh, Dr. Nimhard talks about that in the book as well, the, the importance of pre-existing relationships. Uh, <clears throat> if you want to get started fast, start with people that you already know and can um, like find consensus on a shared mission, vision, values. Um, if you um, like know you have an idea and are looking to find other people, um, then you'll have to kind of do a process of like relationship building, networking, um, like finding that, I think in co-ops we say it's three people core uh, to start that cooperative. Um, and from that point, um, I would recommend that like once we have the core, uh, we start putting in those governance processes and at least uh, how we divide up labor, um, how we make decisions, um, and how do we resolve or transform con conflict. Uh, because those are things you're going to want to know early on so if something does go wrong, you're not trying to put that process in place when everyone's mad at each other and can't agree. Um, and then from that point, I think it's 
it's it's kind of a, a foot race to see how fast you can finish. But as long as um, everyone in the co-op like knows how decisions are made, knows who's holding what, um, and can like move through conflict if it arises when it arises, um, like I think all of the emergent stuff that comes you can handle. Yes. Yes. Um, so how, how should people keep up with, uh, with the work that you're doing? Um, follow, you know, what, 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 what should we follow? What should we look after? Where are we going uh, from here? Um, you can find us on Facebook, uh, repaired.nations. Um, also Instagram, repaired.nations. Um, we, um, as I said, we host a uh, book club Monday through Friday, 12 noon, 3 Eastern. Um, and so if you want to um, follow us on the last two weeks of this uh, 12 week journey, um, you can learn about the Federation of Southern Cooperatives and Modern uh, Solutions for Cooperatives. Um, and that's on YouTube, Repaired Nations, and Instagram. Um, we have a, a, a website, repairednations.org, but it's, uh, it's kind of embarrassing because we need to update it. So uh, just <laughs> find us on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, send us a message, and uh, we'd love to um, help you out, um, especially if you're in the Bay, um, if you're black and brown and you want to start a co-op with your friends or family. Um, yeah, yeah, that's our info. Absolutely. And, uh, and you know, and this uh, while the Facebook page is linked in the, the text of the, the video, um, I have put, you know, the website into the, the, the comment section. So, you know, go, with the, go there at your own risk, <laughs> you know. But, uh, yeah, you can find Repaired Nation's website and, you know, and I'm, I'm sure you can link out to the Instagram, if, you know, we'll, we'll make sure we drop that in the comment section as well. I've also dropped in uh, the comments, you know, the East Bay uh, Permanent Real Estate uh, Cooperative's website, ebprec.org. Um, so, you know, make sure that you check that out. Um, yes, and, and, and go ahead and uh, follow um, those entities uh, on Instagram, on Facebook. Um, keep up with the work that they're doing. Uh, think about how that work relates to your own community. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and, and really, you know, think about how these principles uh, can, can uh, ground you um, in your own life as you try to figure out how to collaborate and how to cooperate with other people. Um, you know, is there anything you, else you want to leave folks with um, as we close out the broadcast? Right. Yeah, um, <clears throat> the Sustainable Economies Law Center, uh, the place that I'm currently employed, um, has online legal cafes. So if you are seeking some legal advice, um, <clears throat> we specialize in California, but if you're outside of the state, we can still give you some information. Um, <clears throat> that is going on tomorrow, um, the 11th, August the 11th at 5 p Pacific time. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> it happens three times a month. So if you didn't catch it this month, you can catch or if you if you didn't catch it this week, you can catch it at another time. But, you know, I just want to make sure uh, you all know uh, where you can get the, uh, the information you need. Absolutely. And uh, I'll also go ahead and put that uh, the Sustainable Economies Law Center website um, in the, the comment section so that you can go. You all can go ahead and check that out. Um, the SELC, the S-E-L-C dot org, uh, T-H-E-S-E-L-C dot org. Uh, so be sure to go there and, um, you know, you can find those uh, legal cafes in their events uh, page. Um, yeah. And, you know, and, and, and with that, um, you know, I, I really appreciate you being on the broadcast uh, this evening, Greg. I really appreciate the work that you're doing. And, you know, I look forward to further collaborations, further exchanges and uh, building this uh, Pan-African Solidarity Economy Network that can, you know, uh, shift the black diaspora into a cooperative future. I say, I say, I'm looking forward to it, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Take care. All right. All right. You be well, Greg. I be well. Take care. All right now. Okay, folks, uh, that concludes tonight's broadcast of the Ujima Hour. Um, we really appreciate you all joining and viewing with us this evening. Uh, we really appreciate you taking in uh, the words and the work of uh, Gregory Jackson, uh, the Repaired Nations, the Sustainable Economies Law Center, uh, and uh, the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative. We hope that it has been meaningful, uh, insightful, informative, uh, and we look forward to um, you joining us uh, next month. Um, so our guest next month, if I can find my schedule, um, our guest next month is going to be Bianca Shaw of Tribe. 
Uh, so that's going to be on September 14th. Uh, so, you know, uh, tune in on, on September 14th so we can uh, we can collectively learn about the work of tribe. You know, this is uh, one of the new uh, names to the broadcast. You know, um, I, I haven't really been fully acquainted with the work of tribe co-create, but I'm really looking forward to what Bianca is going to share with us um, on the broadcast. Um, in October, we'll have Eric Jackson of Black Yield Institute um, so that the, the Baltimore will, will, will be in, uh, in the house. Um, we'll have uh, on November 9th, Malikia Johnson of the Take Care of Each Other World Tour. Um, you know, so really looking forward to uh, sharing the work of Malikia. And then uh, closing out the year, December 14th, Alita Ture of Parable of the Sower, uh, Intentional Community Cooperative. Um, so uh, be sure to tune in um, to the Ujama Hour broadcast. We're here every second Monday of the month. Um, and, you know, um, 7.30 is the time, uh, unless, such, unless, you know, there's a power outage, unless, you know, our guest, you know, um, is unable to make it. We, we sometimes shift to, for that reason. But otherwise, you'll find us here second Monday of the month um, on the Ujima Hour. And until then, uh, we bid you peace. Be well, all. <laughs>